Dr. T. Edmund Boon, uh, Director of the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights, uh, as well as the representative of Malaysia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission of Human Rights, or ICHA, for the period of 2016 to 2018. So, um, and he is also the head of chambers uh, at Amer One Advocates. Um, today we will discuss um, the condition of human rights diplomacy for human rights protection in ASEAN, whether real Okay, and um, Mr. Edwin Moon will have um, the pleasure and the liberty to share with us his uh, reflection. After serving as the representative of Malaysia, on um, the Asian Inter Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights and see how, whether we have actually in the 10 years, if I can say, the 10 year of ICHER has been uh, in the region, whether human rights diplomacy really matter is in Asia, or whether the same goal can be achieved by other means. Uh, for now, what uh, what we like to invite, says I would like to invite uh, Mr. Edmund to share with us for 30, 40 minutes, and it followed by uh, Q&A. But uh, Edmund was actually telling me that what he really seek is your input and uh, comment or reflection of yourself, and how do you see the human rights situation in the region, and is there anything that we could do better? Uh, for now, uh, Mr. Edmund, uh, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Vitri. Thank you, uh, CSIS. This is my first time here, and I see that you are funded very well. And I keep asking who funds CSIS, but nobody wants to tell me. Um, uh, and I want to try and learn uh, from CSIS and all the ISIS think tanks around the region uh, how work is being done on human rights in the region. Um, thank you very much for inviting me again uh, on this topic. And I, I want to provide some context. I think you know what's happening in the region and in Malaysia recently there has been a change in administration. And as part of the change in administration, as you could have witnessed from our Prime Minister's uh, speech at the UN, the foreign policy or the new foreign policy of Malaysia has been to put uh, at the forefront uh, of Malaysia's priorities human rights around the world and especially in the region. So the speech has been of the Prime Minister has been lit understanding or use of human rights diplomacy in the region in the way that I'm going to describe it uh, today. So I don't plan on giving a lecture but I also like feedback from a lot of you who are experts and I see on the attendance list uh, how a country like Malaysia in Southeast Asia can utilize the resources and the expertise that the region has uh, as well as the inputs from the think tanks to look into having more human rights, uh, more effective human rights diplomacy uh, in the region through, for example, organizations like the ASEAN. So today, just to provide some context, again, uh, in, in, it's just not going to be a lecture. Uh, I don't have PowerPoint slides, I'm not technologically savvy, I don't have pictures, uh, I only have uh, some words uh, and, and some suggestions and as well as some observations from my time in the three years. So I can't name some the representatives that said certain things, but I will be open in uh, explaining what happened in the past three years on 
uh, certain developments regarding human rights uh, in Aceh because I, I see there are some spies here around uh, the table uh, from government and member states. Uh, so I thought I could come here and speak a bit freely, but uh, I will try to still speak freely. Um, I will publish uh, my, my, my notes uh, on the website and I'll share it later. Uh, but I won't go through the whole thing, it's about 12 pages. I think uh, one, the point that um, I want to look at today is when we talk about human rights diplomacy, number one, what does it mean by human rights diplomacy? What does diplomacy mean and what does human rights diplomacy mean? And then from that to look at the language of official ASEAN documents where we have noticed outcome documents arising from human rights diplomacy. So at its very basic, diplomacy is usually required when an unsatisfactory situation has arisen that falls to be remedied. It is a process of constant negotiations, most often between member states or between member states and intergovernmental or international organizations or civil society groups for the realization of an agreed outcome. So committed advocacy is one of the hallmarks of human rights diplomacy. It is a process that by design does not stop and should not stop. And it has been said in 1979 that the diplomacy of human rights is as timeless as the appeal of the American Declaration of Independence and as timely as the latest arrest of a political dissident. Such advocacy may at times be conducted by non-state actors such as civil society organizations as well as through the peer pressure of governments. The diplomacy may be loud. On the other hand, quiet diplomacy operates on the principle of engagement with persuasion and sometimes the prospect of more public advocacy as its primary tools. Human rights diplomacy adopts a framework of human rights principles, standards and language. A rights-oriented framework brings with it different approaches and indicators. It places the affected human person at the center of the process and elevates him or her to more than just a mere beneficiary of a grant of goods, services or resources based on sympathy. While there are diverse facets of this type of diplomacy, ultimately the objective is to change the mind. And one way of changing the mind is by way of socialization. Socialization attempts to cajole the other party to receive and accept new information such as facts, figures and norms to shape a better understanding of the situation at hand. The information should as far as possible be conveyed in a way that is neutral and the simplest way is by providing a forum for member states to constructively engage with one another. This would entail a more open discussion and deliberation of issues that affect human rights. But such meetings may also take place in a closed-door setting. When it happens, the process of human rights diplomacy highlights and requires a constant tussle between the various players to portray as an undeniable truth and seeks to emphasize the need to arrive at an agreement for certain fundamental principles and entitlements. So agreements may be arrived at different ways, persuasion, consultation, intervention, or sometimes coercion. And at times, and we have seen this quite often, an agreement to disagree is achieved by parties for purely symbolic purpose will agree to an official text of a particular outcome document, but without intending to carry out the agreement. So needless to say, the use of language in diplomacy is important and the final outcome documents that are released are not indicative of the level and depth of the diplomacy between member states that went into them. They do not speak of the negotiations, compromises and concessions. That which are published only reflect the agreed text that will be published. And for today, I will focus on the use of human rights language by ASEAN in the context of human rights protection uh, as opposed to promotion in the region. The second area that I 
would like to expound on is Have ASEAN member states, through ASEAN, use human rights language in matters of human rights protection in the region, as opposed to human rights promotion. Given that the ASEAN Charter is 12 years old, the IHR is 10 years old, the AHRD, Human Rights Declaration, is 5 years old, one would assume that the answer is quite, quite obvious. But if we dissect the question further, we would ask, what is the role of ASEAN in relation to human rights? Has human rights diplomacy ever been deployed by ASEAN? This takes us back to the joint communique of the 26 ASEAN Ministerial Meeting AMM in Singapore. The meeting was held from the 23rd to the 24th of July 1993, and there three paragraphs were devoted to human rights. There was an affirmation, a, a reaffirmation of ASEAN's commitment to and respect for human rights. But the AMM first emphasized that the promotion and protection of human rights should not be politicized, whatever that means. But those are the words in the statement. Second, the AMM stressed that violations of basic human rights must be redressed and should not be tolerated under any pretext. And this was in 1993. However, the statement goes on to say, cognizance must be taken of the principles of respect for the national sovereignty, territorial integrity, and non-interference in the internal affairs of the member states. So while at the same time, there is an affirmation that human rights cannot be tolerated under any circumstances. There is also language that talks about the three exceptions, where it affects national sovereignty, territorial integrity, and non-interference in the internal affairs of member states. Such language allows government exit points when it comes to troubling human rights situations. And the AMM was probably predicting how human rights could, if left unchecked, be a pesky driver for the change of governments in ASEAN. The qualification of national sovereignty, territorial integrity and non-interference to human rights protection has been repeated ad nauseum. It sets the stage to limit the use, influence and reach of human rights diplomacy. Or rather, it raised a barrier that required human rights diplomats to navigate through or around to reach their stated objectives. But I would argue that depending on how one interprets the ASEAN Charter and the HRD, both documents at the moment provides sufficient basis for effective human rights diplomacy to take place. The guarantees for human rights promotion and protection are in those documents and they can be used. So this is the evidence that can be afforded in terms of human rights protection. And just looking at the moment at the ICHA, when the ICHA was set up in 20, uh, to, uh, 20, um, 2009, today it has led and organized more than 60 activities. 60 activities ICHA led either by way of uh, official 10 body ICHA, um, uh, by way of the, the 10 um, uh, representatives representing ICHA as leading that, that event, 60 over. But in addition, there are also a large number of activities that were led by one or two ICHA representatives in the name of their local ICHA office. So it may be in ICHA Indonesia, ICHA Malaysia, ICHA Thailand. Um, and that invitation would go out to all the sectorial bodies and ICHA as well. Meaning if you are looking at, at a very least 
um, IHR itself having more than 60 activities. That's a large number. Um, bear in mind that any activity um, for IHR requires participation of, or invitation at least to 10 representatives, 10 government officials from the sectoral bodies that we are engaging with, and a budget for every activity would be looking at something from 60,000 USD onwards. So some activities would be, we will be looking at about 90 to 100,000. Um, and that is a lot of money for one activity. Sometimes activities which are small will have uh, a budget of something like 30 to 40,000, but uh, that is really the bare minimum. So when we look at the 60 over activities, human rights language has been used. And it's a, a very good uh, progress. It's, it's taken some time to come this way, but human rights language has been used. And why human rights language has been used is because there was no choice. The AHRD and the ASEAN Charter and the IHR Terms of Reference uses human rights language. Within the IHR itself, there has been briefings and discussions on troubling human rights situations in the region. And one of these has been the Rohingya Rakhine State situation. Either by way of retreat or either and recently by way of official um, statements and briefings in official meetings. So it used to be the case that the, there would be a one-way briefing uh, before our term 2016, but by way of retreat, meaning it's not an official uh, statement or official record of the IHA, but slowly from 2016 onwards, the documents and the discussions have become a bit more formalized and there are statements uh, regarding the discussions in the summary record of, of the IHA. So human rights language is used. But I think the summation that can be made is that much of the human rights language that is used within the IHA at the moment reflects issues pertaining to the promotion of human rights. And I think that's where the comfort level has been achieved between ASEAN member states and representatives. There is very little opportunity or very little movement on the protection mandate. I drafted and proposed a communication mechanism and presented it. And after many meetings and discussions, there was still no agreement. I understand that this year there will be some efforts to look into the communication mechanism to implement it. Some representatives during 2016 to 2018 have taken a position that the IHR has no protection mandate in its term of, terms of reference. And therefore, once again, it goes back to the question of how one interprets the terms of reference. The terms of reference include seeking information from country members, uh, representatives and ASEAN member states on human rights matters of interest in their country. And we say that that's a mandate. However, some representatives argue that that mandate only allows a request for information based on the reporting to the UN on the three respective treaties, the CEDAW, the CRC, and the CRP. At the same time, some representatives have taken the position that because the ICHA is an intergovernmental body, any communication mechanism will breach the non-interference principle. And some others have repeatedly argued that when the ICHA conducts its promotion work, it is also protecting human rights because the promotional activities that ICHA conducts will sensitize government officials to become more human rights compliant. 
It's a very interesting argument, and it's an, it's an argument that cannot be dismissed outright, but it has been repeated in AICHA meetings by at least one or two representatives, that when you do promotion work, you automatically actually do protection work. And that is the justification for not requiring any other form of communication or protection me mechanism. So what I've seen the past uh, 10 years of the AICHA is that in the context of this journey of human rights diplomacy just within the AICHA and within the region, there are these three stages. Uh, and I think it's been said in different ways before, but I can summarize it into these three stages. The first stage is the stage of institutionalization. The second stage is the stage of socialization. And the third stage is the stage of legitimization. So if we look at the stage of institutionalization, and i just give some examples. Of course, uh, we have seen the successful negotiations that led to the formation of the or, the, or the formalization of the AHRD, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. And of course, uh, before that, uh, we, uh, in 2007, there, there is a book called The Making of the ASEAN Charter. It's, it's there where the discussions on the high-level panel when they drafted the ASEAN Charter they said that the most contentious issue in the ASEAN Charter was the attempt or the agreement to come uh, and to, to establish a human rights body. I think that's Article 14 of the ASEAN Charter. That was the most contentious uh, issue. So I, I, if, I, if, I, if I recall correctly, Philippines, Thailand and Indonesia were for a human rights body. Uh, Brunei, Singapore, Malaysia were occupying the middle ground and I think the CRM countries were against the human rights body, uh, against setting up a human rights body. But that's a, a story for another day and for, for the drafters to tell, tell us, but it's in that book. Um, so that, that is the most contentious, um, I think one of the most contentious elements in terms of human rights in the ASEAN Charter. But that kind of negotiation led to where we are now, where there is now this AICHA. And then the AICHA in 2009 drafted the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration in 2012. And again, there was a whole process of what rights were to be included and what rights were not to be. So the human rights type of diplomacy uh, out, uh, within the AICHA led to the HRD. The human rights type diplomacy within the high level led to the ASEAN Charter and within the AICHA, the diplomacy for almost two or three years to draft even a document um, such as the guidelines on AICHA's relations with civil society organizations that was adopted in February 2015 took something like three or four years just for a document in how AICHA is to accredit civil society organizations and to deal with them. So an example of how that document has grown in practice, although it's taken so long, is that for the first time, we have seen in three uh, dialogues, sorry, two dialogues, an institutionalization between AICHA and the accredited CSOs of an annual dialogue and an annual interface. So it started with uh, Bohol in 2017 and then last year in uh, Thailand, Chiang Rai in 2018, where we took advantage of the AICHA's yearly uh, annual report and anniversary to have an event to invite the accredited CSOs to have interface and dialogue and it was an opportunity for CSOs to use that also as a communication mechanism because all the IHR reps would be at the dialogue or most of the IHR reps would be at the dialogue so you could tell us face to face and bring up communication and cases during that dialogue. 
So while we had a document on guidelines of um, I just relations with CSOs, in practice it has metamorphosized into something uh, a bit stronger, although it's not on paper, but we are hoping that the dialogue will continue in this year and the next year where all the accredited CSOs will have an opportunity to meet the IHR representatives. In terms of another document, the most recent document that is quite interesting and the way it was done gives some lessons to how we may be able to say this was a form of human rights protection uh, is that at the 33rd ASEAN Summit in November 2018, ASEAN adopted the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025, mainstreaming the rights of persons with disabilities. The master plan was initially conceived and driven by Aicha Thailand, Dr. Sri. Uh, and after much debate, and there was, of course, debate within Aicha, there was disagreement within Aicha, there was ultimately a concession to set up a cross sectorial task force to draft the master plan. And the cross sectorial task force uh, is a tripartite task force comprising representatives of the AICHA, the ACWC, and some sort. The process started in 2016, and I must say that the AICHA could not have on its own been able to accomplish having the master plan drafted or accepted. And this is again a deficiency that we need to bear in mind because I know for a fact that a lot of the ICHA representatives were confident to accept the text of the master plan only because the task force had members of SOMSWAT in the task force. The members of SOMSWAT are the government officials in all our different countries which implements the national program